Apollo. This is uh, Kai Opua 5 once again, bringing you another segment of Voices of the Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. And today we're very happy to have with us uh, Malia Nobriga. Malia, we've been trying to get together <laughs> with you for a long time. You've been busy and we've been running around, so finally <laughs> we managed to, uh, it seemed like we bump into each other everywhere else in the world except at home. Uh, yeah, overseas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I don't know. I guess you've probably seen some of our, some of our uh, videos, mm -hmm. some of our shows, and they vary. But the, the basic concept is we're trying to uh, share with those who are watching. You know, could be here in Hawaii, could be anywhere. Uh, share the the good things that are being done in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, for Hawaii's future, and really for even beyond that. But uh, that's could say we're hoping this to be motivational. Uh, you're busy. Everybody we interview is busy. <laughs> but there's some people who haven't found out what their kuleana is yet, and we're mm -hmm. hoping that we can encourage them, you know. So we talk with as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And you cover such a broad spectrum of, of different things. Uh, I wonder if maybe we could just start out and you could tell a little something about Malia Nobriga. Okay. And kind of come forward, and then we can talk about whatever projects or whatever you're working on that you would like to share. Okay, you know, um, aloha kako. Um, my name is Malia Nobriga. Um, I'm originally from the island of Kauai, mm -hmm. from Hanapepe Valley. Um, my parents are Gilbert and Rosalind Nobriga, and they continue to live in Hanapepe Valley. Mm -hmm. um, I have two brothers, an uh, older brother, Gilbert, who is married to Barbara and they have four children and a number of mo'opuna now. Mm -hmm. um, and then my younger brother is Mark Nobriga, who lives at home with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, I moved here to Oahu after graduating from Waimea High School. And unfortunately, I never moved back to Kauai Never yet. got back. Um, last, last time we were talking, man, it must have been, what, a year before last, and you were thinking, Maybe I'll get to go back home. Yeah, I think. Hasn't worked out, huh? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that's definitely still in my plans, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but I go home as often as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, one of the things or the, well, of course, my ohana brings me back to Kauai, but mm -hmm. I think one of the cultural practices that also continues to bring me back to Kauai that's really important to our ohana and to Hana Pepe is that of salt making. Sure. And you know that's uh, um, something that our, our ohana has continued to do throughout generations and something I'm really proud of you know that our ohana, ohana is able to share our paakai mm -hmm. with ohana around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that also has helped to ground some of the work that I've done in the community, um, whether it be locally or um, nationally, regionally in the Pacific, or even sure. internationally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, recently I was able to attend the global meeting in Copenhagen regarding climate change. And in many of my interviews that I had done there, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, why is climate change so important to mm -hmm. me? And why do I participate in these right. global meetings? Mm -hmm. And for me, as a salt practitioner, you know, as a producer, climate change is definitely affecting our, our this cultural practice that right. only exists in one place in all of Hawaii and continues. Also, as a kumu, I think, you know, making sure that our um, younger generations continue to learn how to make lei or how to gather um, and how to just say mahalo to to papahana moku to our aina for producing um, the biodiversity that it does and mm -hmm. you know and i think i don't know that's for me always really important to make sure i come back home and um we kind of recharge your batteries too yeah huh? definitely touch bases i mean you you travel in so many different uh, countries and so many different cultures and I know myself uh, they used to call it biofeedback you know when you would think about something positive and you would call it and you and when you it's kind of like you know self-healing type stuff and mm. and I do that when I'm away remotely I, vis I visualize uh, coming into uh, Nepali coast 
uh, Nualolo Kai on a, on, a, mm. on a boat, you know, and the water sparkling and everything is related to our environment and the climate. And I guess, of course, we got, we got our um, so much emphasis, you know, this past year on climate change. Mm -hmm. So although, you know, we know what the main focus of that Copenhagen meeting was, all of these other strands were going on at the same time still, right? Yeah. Carrying forward. You know, I forget the numbers that participated in Bonn mm -hmm. uh, year before last. Mm -hmm. it seems to me 60,000 were in Bonn. Yeah. Something like that, just to participate in, the, in that gathering. And I understand there were even more in Copenhagen, huh? Yeah. I mean, just civil society alone, you know, were thousands and thousands of people. I mean, mm -hmm. 40,000 at least, which was just non-governmental organizations, right. you know, and even have access to some of these meetings, the internal meetings. Couldn't get in. We couldn't even get in. Right. And, you know, at these climate change meetings, which fall under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples, Native Hawaiians, Kanaka Maoli, mm -hmm. we can't, I mean, we're the voiceless people there. Mm -hmm. That's what we said over and over because mm -hmm. when these meetings would happen, we're left outside the door and our right. only means to work with the government representatives is to wait until they come out of the meeting and then we begin to lobby by right. talking story with them or mm -hmm. passing out our position papers, right. you know. And right. so for us, that's really frustrating compared mm -hmm. to other UN meetings like say the Convention on Biological Diversity right. where we're actually able to sit at the table right. and we're recognized in this convention as traditional knowledge holders mm -hmm. and so we're able to provide our own um, you know provide our own statements and mm -hmm. pro just actually have a voice there right. Right. and for governments to come and to seek you know, our advice on right. different things. So we have those friendly governments and unfriendly governments, of mm -hmm. course, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it was just a really hard meeting to be at. And there were about 200 um, indigenous peoples from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that that's always the most exciting part for me. Sure. It's to come together um, as indigenous peoples of the world and, you know, having a few of us from the Pacific, from the Arctic, from North America, um, you know, from all the regions and to just join together and to come up with, you know, those basic principles that we can all agree upon, even mm -hmm. though we're so diverse sure. as peoples. You know, I think to me, if we walk away with anything, it's always making sure that that solidarity between our yeah. peoples yeah. around the world is strengthened each time. Right. That's, uh, that's true. I mean, any time people can get together, I think it's an opportunity for something good to happen and sometimes it's only that you build your own relationships and mm -hmm. and of course that goes on I mean you keep seeing the same people around the world you know and then occasionally some occasionally some new ones come in and they're they're welcomed in uh, it always amazes me the uh, level of uh, expertise and experience you know knowledge uh, ability to communicate mm -hmm. uh, that's demonstrated there uh, this not having a voice is a pattern. I mean, it's not, not just there, right? Right. And the voiceless people, the indigenous people. But one of the things that does happen, at least if you can get to the table and speak, and we can share your, our perspective, your perspective, you have a better chance of making yourself understood to the others, you know, even if it's not to their advantage. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can make some concessions. I know in Bonn, there were a couple of breakthroughs that happened. Mm -hmm. But there's no major victories happening. It's just to uh, take a little bite at a time and chew it up, you know, and just keep going. So that's, uh, I, you know, I can't, I can't uh, tell you how cold it made me feel when I was <laughs> when I was reading, you know, the email communications from Copenhagen, because uh -huh. uh, you know we got our Pacific people up there and it's freezing. Yeah. And uh, and a few from Samoa was uh -huh. said, oh, it's really cold here. And you folks actually spent some time outside, right? The yeah. March, there was a march. Yeah, um, halfway through the meeting, we we participated in a march with at least 100,000 people yeah. who came from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And indigenous peoples were, were allowed the first slot in the, per, um, in the march. Mm -hmm. And so we led, you know, everyone in this mm -hmm. march and we were able to, to share our different, you know, um, chants yeah. and 
you know, Olelo, some of it was in uh, English, some of it was in Spanish. I mean, mm -hmm. but we were all just trying to come together and to right. make a statement there. And mm -hmm. it was freezing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was freezing in Copenhagen. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it was hours and hours yeah. of walking. Yeah. But we felt that it was an important message that the world leaders needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was just about the time when Obama and other um, presidents of different countries and leaders were all flying in mm -hmm. to make you know the last few days of Copenhagen right. try to mean something right unfortunately the outcome what many people are saying is just a failure and yeah. you know there was no binding agreement mm -hmm. and nothing came out of Copenhagen it's it's just it's just crazy I think yeah. I mean it sounds really frustrating uh, there are going to be subsequent meetings and they've already scheduled been scheduled right mm -hmm. but it's kind of hard to go back it takes a little while to heal up and uh, generate that energy to go back and do it again huh? well you know one exciting thing um, that happened I, I mean I think it has been ongoing is for the uh, country of Bolivia mm -hmm. under Evo Morales and you know he's been pushing a lot and his administration has been pushing a lot for not the rights of people as a standalone, but really rights of Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And that we're here for all humanity, um, you know, whether it be for our our biodiversity, our kalo, or whether we're here for our kohola, or, mm -hmm. you know, just all plants, animals, people, mm -hmm. our aina, um, the kai, I mean, just everything. And I think that that is something that was really missing from a lot of these discussions is that holistic view mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's why I think it meant a lot for us as indigenous peoples to look to countries like Bolivia who are willing to take that holistic view and I think that can only happen with countries who have indigenous leaders yeah. like Eva Morales and he's actually looking to having um, a follow-up and it happening April 22nd in Bolivia, oh, which is um, Mother Earth Day, yep. yeah, and Good. to have a way to come up with something where countries can actually make some good decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, some, you know, I've heard that some people are already planning to attend this mm -hmm. meeting, and you know, I mean, we'll see what comes out of there. Not to, not necessarily to go to a lighter side, but um, have you seen the movie Avatar? I haven't. You haven't seen it yet? No. Okay. I recommend it. And, okay. and primarily because I don't know that a lot of people realize it. I mean, I think a lot of folks go see it and they think, oh, it's really a nice story and it's a, kind of a fairy tale. And the graphics, you know, the computer graphics and stuff are kind of neat. But really, it's a story about what's going on today, you know, where the dominant cultures are destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. destroying the indigenous people who are closest to the environment, the extractive industries, the mining industries, mm -hmm. and so forth. That's the gist of the story, and it's yeah, not a yeah. fairy, fairy tale. I mean, you could have changed the name of the people, you know, to any indigenous group, and you could have left the dominant people as either the U.S. as they were portrayed, it could have been Canada, mm -hmm. could have been any of those. Mm -hmm. And that was the theme, so I, I recommend you go see that. Okay. And uh, not that you need... Not that you need <laughs> any more background in that direction, but what's important is uh, that somebody in the creative in the film industry recognizes that and gets it. Mm. My, I talked to my grand granddaughter a couple a couple weeks ago now, I guess, and I mentioned Avatar. I said, "Have you seen it?" She said, "Yeah." Did you go see it? She, when she was in school. It's almost like maybe five, six years ago. Oh. She was in school in Southern California and fellow students of hers were working on this film at that time oh. on, the, on the graphics, computer graphics. Wow. So this thing had been in the works for a long time. Mm -hmm. So to me, what's significant is someone in our creative film industry or a writer, whoever put the story together, knows what's going on. Mm. And so it's a great way to, great way to share it. I think somebody's got to interpret, really, what it what it means for those who don't link up with it. Yeah. You know? 
Well, I think, you know, film and media, um, the internet, I mean, all these different technologies that are out today are really uh, the best tool or one of the best tools we have out there that we can use as Indigenous peoples to have a voice, mm -hmm. you know, and to put our voice out there. And uh, I mean, I think like, you know, this show and many other shows who are able to to share a voice of mm -hmm. our people. You know what? You know what would be a great idea? If there was like a global uh, server that provided information from all around the world, would that be a great idea? <laughs> <laughs> wait well, a minute, wait a minute. Didn't you work to help put that together <laughs> through the UN uh, well, Indigenous that was, Portal? <laughs> That was actually one of our projects that um, we continue to work on, yeah. which is the Indigenous Portal. And that was actually an outcome and a mandate from the Indigenous Caucus that um, came together, I think in 2000 or even before that. Mm -hmm. we, um, a bunch of us were at the World Summit on the Information Society right. and, you know, just discussing, I mean, when governments discuss who owns the internet and who has access to it. I mean, it was really important that Indigenous peoples were there to claim and to say, we have rights to all of this. Mm -hmm. We have rights to our own media, mm -hmm. you know, and I think at that point we were able to, to come together as a caucus and to say, you know what, we need, we need one place for us to have information, mm -hmm. whether it be audio or video and, you mm -hmm. know, something that can be used by indigenous peoples around the world and mm -hmm. we took into account that there are many indigenous peoples who don't have even access to basic yeah. infrastructure right, right. you know and so we know that this isn't the answer to everything right but um it is a place for for um indigenous peoples to have a voice and um you can find us on the internet now indigenousportal.com right and you know we have a manager an indigenous manager who is tiano tuyono Mm -hmm. I think he's been on the show sure, before, yeah, yeah. you know, and he's um, he's been really great with pulling it together, doing a lot of the technical stuff, but mm -hmm. also, you know, just keeping us all grounded. And, um, you know, we were able to bring together editors um, from each region. Um, we try to produce. When you say region now, you're talking about global regions. Global right? regions, yeah. And we, we follow the seven regions. Um, that the United Nations Permanent Forum identifies. Right. So, you know, usually in a lot of these meetings, the Pacific is always clumped together with Asia and we're seen as the Asia Pacific region. Mm -hmm. But now I think we're able to, to become our own region. And that's been really important for the Pacific, yeah. you know, so that we could then have a voice and, you know, like feel, I, I always um, like to repeat what Phil calls the Pacific region as we're the biggest region and we're the liquid continent. I mean, the which is continent. true. Yeah. You yeah. know, we, all of our, the, what surrounds all of our islands and what connects all of us is our, is our Moana, our yeah. Kai, you yeah. know, and so I think. Where some, some, some cultures and some, uh, some people see the ocean as being something that divides. Right. Yeah. But it, yeah. it kind of it connects us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's been exciting is to also um, have content on our portal um, in four um, languages, mm -hmm. English, Spanish, French, and Russian. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been exciting. I mean, we want to be able to expand to have it in different indigenous languages as well. Right. And right now we have the, the um, infrastructure already there and so we would just need people who is sh willing to share content and to produce right. content yeah. and feature it on the portal mm -hmm. so uh, that's been a really exciting project for us and well I know that uh, at least uh, at least one of our voices of truth videos um, was put up there year before last I think mm -hmm. it takes a lot of information management and it takes a lot of creative writing mm -hmm. uh, takes a lot of documentation uh, and if you've got all the regions do you have uh, do you have key people in each region who are responsible for kind of like the gateway for information or yeah we do um, so the editors are pretty much the the main people or um, it 
could also come through our board members mm -hmm. because the governing board is the Indigenous ICT Task Force mm -hmm. and ICT stands for Information Communication Technologies. Mm -hmm. And so this is just one of the projects that comes under the Indigenous ICT Task Force. Mm -hmm. So we have people like Kenneth Deer from sure. Mohawk, right. um, Territory from mm -hmm. Kanawage who's been uh, uh, um, who has owned his own newspaper, The yeah. Eastern Door, you know, and has right. done so much work in media. Um, you know, he's one of our board members, so we're sure. able to learn from his expertise. He's and prolific. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember every time we get the Mohawk Times or whatever the name of the newspaper yeah, yeah. was, every place we go, he'd have a bundle there for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so it was a natural for him. Plus, he's, he's probably as active as anybody I know, you know. Uh, in the in the UN exchange for indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I mean, like any other project or activity, you know, we there's our struggles and sure. our achievements. And but I think we've learned so much from this project over the last four or five years. And you know, um, some of our board meetings because we all live in the different regions, mm -hmm. we've had to coordinate that. You know, because one board member is in. Burkina Faso in Africa. Mm -hmm. Another board member is here. Another board member is in Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. Another one is in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, one is in Canada. One is in New York. You know. Right. So, besides dealing with time zones, we're also dealing with technology and right. is the connection good enough? Right. And, <laughs> but I think you know we're pretty successful to try and use the technology to our advantage. Mm -hmm. So I think for me that was one of the lessons I learned is just how to conduct business mm -hmm. by doing the work, um, you know, by using the technology. Mm -hmm. And I mean that was really exciting for me. And I think you know a lot of our our youth out there are so up on using the technology yes, exactly. today. And yeah. you know I mean if this is something, you know, we talked about earlier about finding a voice for or a kuleana for, you know, others. And I think, I mean, if I can put a kahea out to anybody, it would be to our opio, mm -hmm. you know, who may be interested in, in looking at these kinds of international projects, um, using media, using the internet, mm -hmm. you know, feel free to contact me and, um, you know, we would love to partner on these kinds of um, projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and. Uh that's a reality. So much can be accomplished. I remember at one of our meetings when uh, we were talking about what each of us did back home or some of the things we did, and I mentioned the uh, Voices of Truth series. And uh, I talked with some of the some folks from Africa, and the response was, oh, we'd love to do that, but we have to get gasoline. And I said, wait a minute, video internet gasoline. He said, well, we need to have gasoline to run the generator to run the one television that they have in the village yeah. in order to participate. So there's that extreme, and then there's another extreme that I just heard uh, a statistic on that in the United States, 85% of the households have internet access. Huh. So it's amazing. Malia, we could go on forever, and I know we didn't even touch on some of the projects you've done and are doing and are going to do. And there'll be future times, but we want to th say thank you for being with us. Yeah, well, I and I'm glad that we finally got together for a little while today. And wish you good luck and travel safely. I know you'll <laughs> be traveling. And we'll see you someplace soon, somewhere. Hi. Mahalo. Aloha. And to you folks out there, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. Once again, I'm Kai Opua Fife for the Kiwani Foundation. Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future, a component of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network. Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends.
Also, view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.